Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Herbert. I'm the Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here in Washington and all of, uh, of those watching uh, at home on, on the web to uh, the release of our latest report, America's Rental Housing 2017. Uh, 2017. Uh, you can find the report on our website, um, and you can also comment about the report on Twitter using the hashtag Harvard Housing Report. This is the sixth report we've done in the series. It's a biannual report going back to the early 2000s, and they've all been undertaken with the generous support of the John, T. And Catherine, uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and Harvard's uh, the Joint Center's Policy Advisory Board. The report has really two purposes. The first is to provide a comprehensive, fact-based overview of the state of rental housing markets to serve as a guide for those looking to understand and document market trends in this vitally important sector of the housing market and the economy. Second, the report is intended to raise awareness and to spur public debate about the challenges we face as a nation in meeting the need for good quality, affordable rental housing, which is home for an increasingly diverse cross-section of the country's families and individuals. So today's gathering we've structured to address both of those purposes of the report. The, in a few minutes, my colleague John Spader who, together with Shannon Rieger, led the development of this year's report, will present an overview of the key findings for the report. In short, since the start of the decade, we've seen a broad-based surge in demand for rental housing, and with that, a strong supply response, but both of which are now beginning to slow to a more measured pace. But the new normal that is emerging after the shifts of the past decade include two troubling elements. The first is that the market has struggled to be able to supply moderate cost rentals. And the second is that even with recent improvements, the number and share of renters paying excessive shares of their income for housing remains not far from record levels. Clearly, new innovative means of supplying rental housing for both low and moderate income households are very much needed. Following the presentation of the report and in keeping with the goal of spurring a healthy and much needed debate, we will turn then to a series of speakers who will speak to the implication of the report's findings for policy and for practice. First, we'll have a conversation with Pam Patnow, Deputy Secretary from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and then Laura Casisto from the Wall Street Journal will moderate a discussion among a panel of experts from the public and private sectors. And then finally, we'll hear from Senator Maria Cantwell of, the, of Washington State, who will speak to the need for a greater federal commitment to expand the supply of affordable housing. But before turning to this year's findings, I'd like to take this opportunity to offer a few words of thanks. First, to the Joint Center staff, to Marsha Fernald, who's our editor, John Skirchak, who's our designer, all of whom have worked diligently to ensure that the report and all of the collateral material are comprehensive, informative, engaging, and I can't understate this, meticulously accurate. Um, I also want to thank the Joint Center staff who worked hard to plan today's event. I'm truly grateful for having such a dedicated and talented staff at the center. Secondly, I'd like to thank the advisory committee who volunteered their time to provide valuable input on uh, the, both the scope of the report and early drafts. The committee was enormously helpful in ensuring that the, rep the report covered important topics and was as balanced as possible. We're indebted to each of them for their important contributions. I won't go through the list of who they are, but they're, they're listed on our website. Um, and I hope that you would, uh, will visit the website both to, to see who was on that advisory committee and to see the report and the collateral material. Finally, I'd like to thank the MacArthur Foundation. Over the last few decades, MacArthur has played a critical role in supporting efforts to investigate and document how housing matters, uh, particularly for the well-being of individuals and families and communities across the country, um, and in particular, how good quality affordable rental housing matters. We are very thankful for the Foundation's invaluable support, not just for the Joint Center, but more broadly for the significant impact they've made across all their endeavors in raising awareness and understanding of rental housing issues and in building the capacity of organizations to address this vital need. With that, let me turn it over to Mito Vodopic, from the uh, Program Officer from the Foundation. Uh, Mito, thank you for your support. Thank you, Chris. On behalf of the foundation, I want to add my welcome uh, to all of you today uh, for this important event. I particularly want to welcome our colleagues from the Trump administration and Senator Cantwell for joining us. We know how critical uh, this conversation is as 
rental housing now provides shelter for nearly 40 percent of American households. Uh, the MacArthur Foundation, as Chris had mentioned, has had a long history of trying to preserve affordable rental housing. For us, for many of you in the room, and we know for many of you in the country, we knew intuitively what now an increasing amount of research is showing with stronger confidence. And that is when housing costs are reasonable, then we can expect positive impacts on a household's health, education, and savings. Our mantra was and is that housing is a platform. And if this platform was attainable, and by that we mean affordable and safe, then the factors that are critical to the quality of life of families and communities would also be positively impacted. When we began this work, uh, particularly on preserving affordable rental housing nearly over a decade ago, our intuition was not sufficient, not for us, not for the organizations we wanted to support, or the policies we were hoping to advance. What we desperately felt needed was current, reliable, and actionable information, particularly about the rental housing stock. And in that regard, we struck up a very positive relationship with the Joint Center at that time and have been exceptionally impressed with the scholarly, incisive work of the Joint Center's researchers. We are thankful and indebted to Chris Herbert and all of the folks that at the Joint Center for their work in helping educate us about this important issue of rental housing. This report, as Chris mentioned, is the sixth and sadly, there remain very disturbing trends in both the supply and demand that I hope everyone here has takes some time to reflect on, but more importantly, when you return to your day jobs, you act on. Of the many details and data insights in the report that we'll soon hear about, one line particularly struck me as troubling, particularly as an American. And that line, as the Joint Center concludes, that we are reaching the new normal where nearly half of all renter households are cost burdened. With so many fellow Americans challenged just to make rent, how do we expect to remain competitive in a global economy? How do we expect to improve our overall public health? Or how do we expect to invest smartly in ourselves or in our future generation? I hope this jarring conclusion sparks a renewed debate about how housing markets and policies can help meet this basic essential need that we all share. And now to give us an overview of these findings in this year's report, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Spader, Senior Research Associate at the Joint Center. Thank you, Neil. And I want to reiterate Chris's thanks to the MacArthur Foundation for their support for the America's Rental Housing Series. Um, I also want to say, reiterate Chris's thank you to the research team, as well as to our designer and editor who help us in every round visualize the data and clarify the ideas that are in the report. Relatedly, in this year's America's Rental Housing Report, we've worked really hard to create online interactive data tools, and I would highly recommend for those watching online and for those in the room to go explore those. For most of the information that I'm gonna um, supply when it's available at the Metro level, we've provided that on our website, and, and in an effort that you can find local, locally specific information about both your metropolitan area, the state, and the national level and compare across areas. So with that, two years ago, we were here presenting the 2015 report. And at that point, signs consistently pointed to rental markets tightening and tightening um, at a rapid pace in markets across the country. The argument among the research team at that point in time was whether or not we were actually seeing rental markets tightening at an accelerating pace or whether or not it was simply strong tightening cycles with high levels of rent growth, um, reduced vacancy rates. Today the story is a little bit more complicated. So we, we see several signs that rental markets have softened, um, particularly at the high end for the highest cost units for the highest income households. And, and a few signs that that may be starting to reach down into the, the middle income tiers, and I'll talk about the details of that in a moment. At the same time, nearly half of all renter households are cost burdened, paying at least or more than 30% of their total household income towards rent. 25% are severely cost burdened, paying more than 50% of their total household income for rent. With 11 million renter households in total, 
um, severely cost burden. So that divergence, I'm gonna use the 30 minutes that I have to dig into the factors that have contributed to those trends and to those outcomes, as well as to talk about their consequences for housing cost burdens, as well as the policy challenges that we face as a country. So just to start with some of the, the broad demographic trends, over the last decade, we've added almost 10 million new renter households in the United States. That's up from a low, or, or from 33 million renter households in 2004 to 43 million renter households today. That increase of 10 million new renter households is larger than at any other point in the record. Um, that's a remarkable flow of households into the rental housing um, market. That's driven by at first, the foreclosure crisis, so foreclosure-related homeownership exits, moving households into, into renting, as well as the barriers to homeownership um, that we've described in other places. In the last year or two, that started to slow. We've seen a, a bit of a reduction in renter household growth back towards what seemed to be more stable levels. So from elevated levels, where during the, the last decade, almost all household growth was happening among renter households, with almost zero household growth among homeowner households. In 2016, we saw a reduction back towards what indicates a more stable homeownership rate. Um, the early signs from 2017 suggest that that slowdown um, will continue. I wouldn't put too much weight on the negative number there. These are volatile uh, measures, but it does reinforce that there is some um, slowdown in overall renter household growth. And I want to highlight a couple of trends about the growth in renter households over the last decade. Of those 10 million renter households, we've seen the fastest growth among the highest income households and among older households, two groups that traditionally haven't been a majority of all renter households. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the growth trends and then we'll come back um, to the overall profile of renter households. So the first thing to observe is that households making $100,000 or more a year increased from 9% of all renter households in 2006 to 13.3% of renter households in 2016. That increase amounts to almost 30% of the overall increase in renter households during that decade. If we broaden that to include households making 50,000 or more, it accounts for 60% of the growth. So you've seen dramatic growth um, among higher income households. That plays out a little bit differently at different metro areas. And I told you I was gonna highlight a couple of our interactive graphs. This is one that I could spend days just looking at different metropolitan areas to see the trends and the different ways that they play out in different areas. I, I've selected Boston, the greater Boston area in Dallas here intentionally. So in Boston, you see um, that, that the Boston area has added not quite 100,000 um, renter households or total renter households over the last decade. More than half of those are households making $100,000 or more a year, much lower rates of renter household growth at lower income levels. In Dallas, we've seen almost the same growth in high-income renter households, but nearly the same level of growth across different income groups. And, and it, it, the pattern in Boston is not unique to Boston. That pattern is replicated if you instead look at other high-cost cities like New York, San Francisco, et cetera. And I think it speaks to the challenges that those cities are grappling with in trying to increase the supply of lower-cost lower rental housing. If we instead look by age, more than half of all renter household growth in the last decade has been among households age 50 and over. And what I'm showing you here um, compares to the, the lighter bars here are total household growth by age category. Um, the green bars simulate if we held the rentership rate con constant at its 2006 level, what would aging of the population alone indicate um, the distribution would look like. And you can see that for households age 65 or 70 and over, the aging of the baby mover generation alone is explaining most of the household growth um, that we see in those age categories. That's likely to continue as the aging of the baby boomers continues. Among middle-aged households and, and at lower, um, in, in lower age groups, um, it explains less of that increase. Instead, for those age groups, um, the, the growth in renter households has been the result of an increase in rentership rates within each of those age groups um, that may be more, uh, more susceptible to change in coming years depending on what trends in both homeownership and renting um, look like for each of those age groups. And the Joint Center projects out household growth for the next 10 years or through 2025 um, by age category um, and it reiterates that the future, um, future household growth will be concentrated in the older age groups among aging baby boomers um, as well as in middle age groups, so between about 30 um, and, and age 45. 
So those trends relate to the uniqueness of growth in higher income and older households. At the same time, it's worth remem remembering that they remain, for the most part, the exception rather than the rule. So in 2016, um, the median renter was um, age 40, so half of all renter households are age 39 or younger. Um, the median income of renter households was $37,300. 20% of renter households make less than $15,000 a year, and in, in the United States today, that includes 8.9 million um, renter households trying to find affordable housing um, on an income of $15,000 a year or less. Um, by race and ethnicity, 52% of renters are white, 20% are black, 20% are Hispanic, and 9% are Asian, multiracial, or, or some other race or ethnicity. That's more diverse than you see among the homeownership population. Um, immigrants account for 20% of all renter households today. So I, I raise that here because as I turn to describe the rental housing stock, it's worth keeping in mind that the stock needs to meet the needs of all renter households across age groups, across um, incomes, across races and ethnicities. And that starts with, I'm going to start just with a, a profile of the overall rental household stock. So this is in, in 2016. 39% of all rental household or of all rental units were single family homes. That includes 28% detached, 6% attached, and 4.5% mobile homes, RVs, and, and other um, types of homes. That's up from 35% in 2001, an increase of about 4 million single family homes during that period. The majority of that growth has come from conversion of units from owner occupancy. And, and uniquely, in the last couple of years, we've seen that increase slow down. 2015 was the first year in the last decade where we've actually seen the number of single family rental homes decline. The other major source of growth in the rental housing stock over the last decade has been large multifamily units. And you can see that they accounted for 21% units or buildings with 20 or more units accounted for 21% of the overall stock in 2016. Um, the majority of the increase in that group has come through new construction. So among newly recently completed rental units, um, the share Uh, among recently completed rental units, um, the share that are in large multifamily buildings has increased from about 55% to above 80% in 2016. That construction is con has been concentrated among higher cost units as well. So in 2001, um, units renting for $1,500 um, a month or more accounted for less than 15% of the of newly completed rental units. Um, by 2016, they were almost 40%. So you can see the shift towards higher cost supply of rental units even after adjusting for inflation. By contrast, units renting for $650 a month or less um, went from 23% of newly completed units um, to less than 10% in 2016. If we instead look at the distribution across uh, of all rental units in the United States, showing it to you here by structure type as well as by rent, um, you can see that for the highest cost units, single family homes and large multifamily homes um, disproportionately provide those units. By contrast, among lower cost units, mid-sized multifamily properties are punching above their weight or are disproportionately serving those groups. Um, raising kind of um, underlining concerns about preservation, especially preservation of market rate units um, among mid-sized multifamily properties. Um, the if we look at the distribution by age, you can see that single family homes are, are most common among middle age groups. Um, that coincides with household formation and, and the development of families in those age groups. Um, single family homes disproportionately provide family sized housing units. So they um, provide a, a number of the units that have three or more bedrooms in the overall American housing stock. Um, by contrast, large multifamily units um, are, are present across all age groups, but increase as households reach um, age 65 and age 75 and over. Um, one of the stories within that category is that large multifamily buildings, especially new, more recently built large multifamily buildings, um, are more likely to be accessible to households with disabilities or to aging households that may be encountering mobility impairments. So in, in our most recent data, only 
of all rental units had three basic accessibility characteristics. A no-step entry, having a bedroom and a bathroom on the floor of the entry level, and having wide hallways that would accommodate a wheelchair. Um, that increases among more recently built units as well as among large multifamily units, um, which is reflected here. It's also reflected if we instead look at, accessibility, at data on the accessibility of rental units. So the final trend I want to highlight here is evolution in the ownership of the rental housing stock. So this is describing um, ownership of characteristics of rental property owners in, in the 2015 Residential Housing Finance Survey. Um, you can see that individual property owners remain the majority of all property owners. So they own 74% of all rental properties and 48% of all rental units um, are in, more represented among single family and two to four unit properties. Um, on our blog, we have a recent blog that compares these numbers to 2001. Um, as I'm sure you're familiar from stories in the news and elsewhere, um, the share of individual investors owning single family properties has declined since 2001. Um, what's equally striking to me is that the share of individual owners, the rise of institutional ownership in the midsize, the five to 49 is just as striking. And that's a story um, that's received less attention in recent years. Okay, so I, I, I wanna, transition here to some of the indicators of the rental market slowdown. And that starts here with completions and new construction starts. Um, since 2009, the number of new starts has grown more than fourfold to a high just above 400,000 um, units per year in, in 2015. That leveled off in 2016 and declined slightly in 2017. So that's a first indication that some of the some of the boom in construction, it remains at a high level, um, but it may be reaching a, a plateau. Um, that's echoed in uh, trends in absorption rates. So this is a measure of, of newly completed units, what, what percentage are occupied within 12 months after be com being completed. Um, and you can see that between 2015 and 2016, absorption rates declined for units renting for $1,250 a month or higher. Um, they don't decline for units. In fact, they increase um, for units renting for less than $1,250 a month. If we instead look at vacancy rates, you can see similar trends. The overall national vacancy rate declined from 2011 through a, a, a low around 7.0% in 2016. It's increased slightly since the beginning of 2017, reaching 7.2% today. So it remains at a very tight rental market, but some signs that it may be increasing slightly. The lines in the graph, we use real, uh, data from Re RealPage Incorporated um, to separate out class A, B, and C properties. It allows us to separate the highest um, rent properties from, from units that rent at, at lower rates. Um, and, and they echo the trends that, that I've highlighted earlier. So among class A, the highest rent units, um, you can see the most consistent increase in vacancy rates. Among class C, the vacancy rate has fallen the furthest from 2011 through 2016. In the last quarter or two quarters, we've started to see that number creep up slightly. So some indication that the softening may be reaching um, further down in the rental market, but that's a very small increase at this point. So it remains to be seen whether that's an aberration or if that's indicative of a longer term trend. The rates of rent growth in recent quarters have also de decreased. So they remain, um, by both of the measures I'm showing you here, they remain more than a percentage point above inflation. So rent growth continues on average across the country to outpace inflation by more than a percentage point. At the same time, it has declined and it's declined um, across all three segments of the rental housing market. Um, so the CPI measure suggests that over the 12 months ending in September 2017, rent growth was 3.9% on average. Um, for the real page measure, which over represents professionally managed properties, um, that number is 2.7% year over year through the third quarter of 2017. So a last dimension of the trends in rent growth that I wanna highlight is we, we've struggled about with how to, how to visualize trends at a neighborhood level. And, and so this chart is showing you um, data at the zip code level that we get from Zillow. Um, and we categorize metropolitan, we take the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States and categorize them by the speed of population growth between 2012 and 2016. And it's striking that the areas that experience the fastest population growth show substantially higher levels of rent growth. Within each of those metropolitan areas, we also categorize the neighborhoods by their price tier at the beginning of the period in 2012. So the lowest to the highest. 
And, and in the areas that are experiencing the fastest population growth, you can see a consistent trend across neighborhoods. The, the neighborhoods that started with the lowest rent levels experienced the fastest rates of rent growth. That appears clearly in the fastest growing areas, slightly less so in the moderately gro growing areas, and is more level in the slowest um, areas. And for me, at least, this speaks to the challenges facing some of the fastest growing cities and how to increase supply in ways that accommodate their growing population and how to deal with issues like gentrification that are raised by um, variation across neighborhoods in, in the speed of rent growth and in demand for rental properties. Um, at the household level, one of the clearest results of it is the presence of cost burdens. So in 2016, 47.5% um, of all renter households um, were cost burdened, paying 30%, more than 30% of their total household income for rent. 25% um, were severely burdened. That includes 11 million households in 2016. Um, you can see that those numbers have declined slightly in recent years. The share has declined from 2011. Part of the reason for that decline has been the fast influx of higher income households. Because that's a share, the disproportionate growth at higher incomes is going to decrease um, the overall cost burden share. Um, if you look instead at the number of cost burden renter households, there has been a slight decrease since 2014, um, but it's at a speed where if you project that out, it's not fast enough that it, it will recover with the economic cycle. Um, instead, at the speed over the past two years, it would take 24 years um, for the number of cost burden renters to return to its 2001 level. And that raises the questions that Mio highlighted about whether or not this is a new normal emerging. Um, are we simply um, structurally at a place where half of all renter households will um, be cost burden moving forward? And, and what does that mean about the vulnerability of those households when we experience the next downturn? Cost burden rates vary quite a bit across income levels. I mentioned before that 8.9 million renter households um, make less than $15,000 per year. Among that group in 2016, more than 80% were cost burdened, more than 70% were severely cost burdened. Those rates de decrease as you move into higher income categories. Um, but the second finding that jumps out from this image is that the fastest growth in cost burdens has been among households making between $30,000 and $75,000 a year. Um, in both of those income categories, um, the cost burden share has increased by more than 10 percentage points um, since 2001. There's a geographic component to these patterns as well. So in the nine largest metropolitan areas of the United States by population, 51% of all renter households were cost burdened in, in 2016. Um, in rural areas, so outside of micropolitan areas with less than 10,000 um, people in population, 39.5% of all renter households were cost burdened. And so there's, there's two ways to look at those trends. One is that these challenges are, are greatest in the largest metropolitan areas. The other is that even in rural areas, almost 40% of all renter households are facing cost burdens. Um, and, and so in, across all of those areas, the question is, what are the options available to increase the availability of, of low cost rental units to respond um, to these challenges? So I'm gonna highlight one more of the interactive exhibit. So on our website, this is one of the maps um, that we've created. It allows for every metropolitan and micropolitan area in the United States. Um, you can get the specific information about um, the area that you live in. So I've, I've highlighted Miami here, so you can see that um, there's more data embedded there. Um, Miami has the highest cost burden rate in the country at, at 61.2% um, with 34.1% um, severely cost burdened. Um, and the tabs along the right allow you, if you want the data instead at a state level to compare your metro to the state, or if you want, um, we provide it at the rural area um, by state. So essentially we group all rural areas within a state and provide cost burden um, measures that way as well. So these trends translate directly into household budgets as well and create um, important trade-offs. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask in this year's report was, we know that rent growth has outpaced inflation for multiple years. And, and, has, and the question is, is whether and for whom, more precisely, have incomes grown fast enough to outpace rent growth? And so this is a fairly simple measure that I'm gonna call residual income. It essentially takes your household income, subtract, subtracts out the amount that you pay for housing costs, and then tracks the amount left over um, for renters in different quartiles of the overall US income um, distribution. And what we find is that for, for renter households with incomes in the top quartile, 
um, their residual income has remained mostly level um, and increased to 7% above its 2001 level in 2016. Um, by contrast, for renters in the bottom quartile, the, the amount left over after paying for housing costs is 18% below where it was in 2001. Um, there's an income component to that. There's a housing cost um, component to that. For that group, the difference between their total household income and the amount that they pay for housing amounts to just $500 on average per month. And so you can imagine if you're trying to pay for all other expenditures, food, transportation, health care, any educational investments for your children, an 18% reduction from $500 on average a month creates real trade-offs and, and hard choices for those families. Which raises some of the questions about how, what, what are the options available to increase the supply of, of lower cost housing units? Um, I'm gonna start here with um, just looking at the availability of, of low cost stock um, and, and particularly for extremely low income renters. So these are renters whose incomes are 30% or less of the area median income. Um, for every 100 um, extremely low income renters, HUD estimates that there are only 66 um, housing units throughout the anywhere in the country um, that are affordable to those 100 renters. Um, but that about half of those units are occupied by households making higher incomes. So for every 100 extremely low income renters, there's only 33 units throughout the country um, that are affordable, adequate, and available. If we increase to very low income renters, so renters making 50% of area median income or less, um, there are 90, on average 93 units that are affordable, but only 54 are also adequate and available. Um, you can see that there's a geographic component to this, the trends across um, counties of different population sizes, um, and that the affordable, adequate, and available units include both assisted units and market rate units. And so in thinking about responses, it requires thinking about both of those. So um, the market rate units, what's sometimes called naturally occurring affordable housing and uh, strategies per for preserving the affordability of, of those units. If we zero in on the uh, assisted rental housing stock, the number that's frequently cited is that only about one in four income eligible households are actually able to um, access rental housing assistance. Um, what's less discussed is that that number has actually been decreasing in recent years. So in 2001, 28% of income eligible households, uh, of very low income income eligible households were able to actually receive rental housing assistance. That declined to 25% um, in, in 2015 as rental assistance hasn't kept pace with the growth in the number of eligible renters. And so finding strategies to increase the availability of rental assistance is one option. Preserving the existing stock of assisted units is another. So over the next 10 years, 1.1 million rental units that currently have um, some restriction on the rent levels, um, we'll see those restrictions expire by 2027. That includes a combination of project-based assistance, low-income housing tax credit, um, and, and other types of assisted um, units. Um, the public housing stock also faces, faces preservation challenges, both in its ongoing maintenance and in responding to its capital needs. If we instead look at the households that occupy um, assisted units, um, the vast majority today are older households, persons with disabilities, or families with children. So 34% are headed by an individual age 62 or older. Um, an additional 23% um, have a head or a spouse with a disability, um, and 32% are, are families with children. And the last uh, of the housing assistance challenges that I wanna highlight um, is homelessness this year. And in the report, we focus primarily on the longer term recent trends in the AHAR, which have shown fairly consistent decreases between 2010 and, and 2016. Since we went to press with the report, the 2017 um, annual homelessness assessment report to Congress has come out. And, and unfortunately, it shows an increase um, in the homelessness rate for the first time since 2010. Um, more concerningly, that increase is concentrated among West Coast cities with the highest levels of rent growth. So it suggests um, that the relationship between um, high levels of rent growth and, and homelessness has tightened in, in recent years. Um, this is just the basic plot of um, metropolitan areas by their median rent against the homelessness rate. And I think most of us at the Joint Center were surprised by how clear that correlation is. 
um, that we expected some level of correlation, but for high cost cities that the homeless rate, homelessness rate um, increases just as much um, as it does. And so lastly, I'd be remiss this year if I didn't include some comment about the rental housing challenges faced by the different cities that have been affected by hurricanes and, and wildfires in 2017. Um, the rebuilding process in those areas takes time. It's not something that happens in one year. It can take two, three, five, ten years um, for different units to be rebuilt. And, and that should be expected. Um, we know from other analysis that remodeling spending peaks two to three years after um, the rebuilding process happens. Um, and, and the data that I'm showing you here is, is um, the best data that I know of that's available are about the rebuilding process. So HUD following hurricanes Katrina and Rita did a visual survey of the rebuilding outcomes of properties that experienced major damage four to five years after the storm. So in early 2010, and, and what they found was that at that time, 74% of homeowner properties had been substantially rebuilt um, compared to just 60% of small rental properties. And in fact, 28% of rental properties um, continue to show substantial repair needs that were visible from the street. That includes about 13% of those that didn't meet the census definition of habitability. So um, they weren't closed to the elements with a working door. That rebuilding process means that there needs to be attention to the needs of renters um, in the rebuilding process. And um, the contributors are, you can imagine that rental, rental property owners don't have the same control over the rebuilding process. They're reliant on property owners. Um, policymakers at various levels have been, for legitimate reasons, reluctant to provide assistance at the same rate to um, rental property owners who didn't adequately insure their properties as they did to homeowners. Um, but the flip side is that the result is a reduction in the stock of units available to rent rental households that are seeking to return to the area. And I know um, that's something that the Deputy Secretary and that the panel may talk more about. Um, and so at this point, I'm going to stop there. And it's my pleasure to hand things back over to Chris Herbert, who will introduce the Deputy Secretary. Here. Great. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, have uh, Pam Patton out, uh, Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, here with us today. Uh, Pam brings, hard to believe, three decades of experience in housing, economic development, real estate, public policy. Uh, immediately before joining HUD, she was president of the J. Reynolds Williger Foundation for America's Families. Uh, this isn't your first rodeo. You were uh, Assistant Secretary for Community Development in a previous uh, Bush administration, and she, uh, she has her uh, home building in her blood. I believe uh, your mother was a home builder. Yeah. You, and, uh, so we, I have to say that I, th I think I speak on behalf of a lot of housers that when you were named to be the Deputy uh, Secretary, we were all thrilled uh, because not only you bring this wealth of experience in the private and private sector, but because of your deep commitment to affordable rental housing. So thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Hello to all my friends out there, my fellow housers. I'm delighted to be back among the housers. Um, just crossing uh, the 90-day mark at HUD. It seems like a lot longer. <laughs> I, I had not expected to uh, return to hurricanes. That's when I left. Uh, it was after two years of working on Hurricane Katrina, but on the bright side, I have experience, so I plan to use that experience. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Joe Ventrone, I promise I won't let you down in the future. I have not left the building very often, so it's nice to be out. Two things that I heard at the start of this session before we get into the Q&A, and um, Neil, I wrote this down because I found it to be fascinating. You said intuition is not sufficient. And as we look at the rebuilding efforts in Texas and particularly in Puerto Rico, data is so important. We need evidence, not just anecdotal. So thank you to the MacArthur Foundation, not just for the funding of this report, but for funding the BPC Housing Commission that prepared me for this position probably more than anything else. And I rely on Chris uh, constantly to help me uh, get up to speed. And Chris, you said something that I wrote down, and that is that the report is with meticulous was was written with meticulous accuracy. If I got that right? Yep. So I believe that the Joint Center for Housing Studies is the gold standard, and I think you know that from our, our yep. months and months of preparation. Uh, 
for my confirmation hearing. I called Chris and I called many of you that are in the room here today to help me get ready, not for the confirmation hearing, but to prepare me for this job. Well, I very much appreciate that. I think you know, we're at the Joint Center where we prepare these reports, I mean, we really view our role as providing a factual basis for a policy discussion. And we want to make sure that that, that gold standard lives up to its, its, uh, its standard. And so we go through every fact in the report, and we sit there at times sweating it out, and we say, I hope the world appreciates this. And I just want to you know, give a shout out to the people back in the office who, uh, who put in long hours to make sure that this is accurate. So we know that when we're talking about policy, we're singing from a hymnal that is a, a factual hymnal. I, I failed to mention, Jonathan, it was excellent presentation. And for those of you that are back in, in Cambridge in the cold, thank you for all the work that you do as well. Well, thanks for that. So uh, I know that, you, as you said, you know, you, you're aware of our work. We've worked closely with you uh, through the years. So m much of this is probably not a surprise. But I guess uh, I'm curious about what do you find to be of most value for you, given where you sit now? And what, what's, what the information in the report do you think uh, you found most surprising and, and most uh, actionable for you? So overall, you know, this is a comprehensive uh, look at the housing landscape, in particular rental housing, which is not something that we talked a lot about before. Is I think this is the sixth, sixth. biannual. Uh, so just having that comprehensive look of, of the housing landscape I found to be, you know, very helpful. But it, when I looked at the press release today, I said, wow, I missed that. So I didn't realize that there was this interactive part. And I often look at my... Uh, two homes, I live in New Hampshire and in Northern Virginia, and it's nice to be able to go to a data point prior to meeting with a, an elected official or a governor and, you know, or, or anyone that comes into the office where they come from. So thank you for including that. That's a new component this year? It is. We've, uh, we've started to try to do that more in our other report, the State of the Nation's Housing, um, but I think it really has come to a new level with this report. And, I, you know, David Luberoff, our deputy director, has been pushing for us to make sure that even though we're writing a national report, we are making sure that it's drilled down. You can drill down to a market area because that's where the conversation needs to happen. And it, every market is different. Even though there are broad trends that are true everywhere, uh, there's cir circumstances different. So having an ability to both personalize it to your market area, understand your market area, um, is something we're really striving to do with the report going forward. All real estate is local. I, I didn't answer your question on what uh, I found to be surprising. I think the demographic shifts in terms of who's renting, uh, and, the, and the income levels. And I can honestly say for the first time in 33 years, I'm thinking about renting because I'd like to have that flexibility. I look out at HUD onto the waterfront and these buildings are blocking my view of the river, <laughs> but I look and say, if I lived there, I'd be home in five minutes. And the, the amenities and um, the other thing that I found um, surprising is that the, the units are not filtering. You would think with all this you know, market rate luxury uh, units that have been added to the housing stock in the last five years that we would see some trickling down and we're not quite seeing that yet. We're not and I think that's something that we're trying to draw attention to here is that while we're seeing the market turn we're not seeing that trickle down and so to the extent that trickle down filter down and to the extent that that's not happening uh, if, if the market is slowing down without having met that need for housing we have a problem and what's something that we need to think about the public and private sectors what they can do about it. And I don't know it, what, what you think you can do about it at HUD. It's a, it's a big problem, but... Um, it, it is a huge problem, but when I looked at that... He gave me the questions in advance, by the way. That doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> um, I asked for them in advance. <laughs> so that I could think about it and, and actually digest the report. Um, I don't see it as the federal government's sole responsibility, and I know in the last paragraph of the report it talks about the need for, for additional subsidies and the federal government's been the primary source. I see this as an all hands on deck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example, and I don't have the exact statistics. I bet you Mike Marshall does, though, because I, uh, I know he was just on the phone. Tyson's Corner, Virginia, that was probably the most concentrated development in the last five years, which is massive. The, the number of buildings that have gone up, mostly rental. And about seven years ago, when I was still with the Urban Land Institute, we had a, an event with the county supervisor and a lot of local elected officials, planners, came together, former HUD secretaries that were on our advisory board, Henry Cisneros in particular, we, we met with them and they have a, a workforce housing policy, but it's a policy, it doesn't have a lot of strength. And every night when I drive home, I wonder how many affordable units were developed, because this was a real opportunity to add to the housing stock, and I don't know the exact answer. Mike, do we know the exact answer to that? 
So I'm going to take a guess. Not many, if any. <laughs> I don't know that to be an absolute fact, but everybody can go back and try to find the answer to that and then send me an email. There was, a, uh, Shekhar, Shekhar might know the answer to this. There, there was an option to opt out. So they could have increased density. And these are massive, massive, massive buildings. And who works in Tyson's Corner? Lots and lots of people, 120,000 jobs. It was probably the biggest housing mismatch. The long way to get to the answer to that question, you know, local communities, the, the local elected officials, states to some extent, they need to start to take ownership of this. This is gonna impact their ability to compete because I don't know who's gonna, service all the jobs that are in two of the largest malls in the United States are right there. And those rents certainly exceed what people can afford to pay with that type of uh, annual income. Right. And I think there's no doubt that uh, among the, there's not any one reason why we can't pro provide more affordable housing. There are multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. One of them, the important one, is the question about state and local regulations about what can get built where. Um, and I don't know if you had a chance to give any thought to, as you say, it's a state and local issue. You do have a few levers up there at the federal government. We, we do. Are there and any things that HUD can do to try to get those state and local governments to do the right thing in the helping to expand the supply of, of affordable housing? So I think the number one thing is to education. And I think a lot of the advocates that are in the room, that's what you do every day. But the federal government has a, you know, a bully pulpit that's very loud. You know, I, you can use a carrot, you can use a stick. and both can be effective, mm -hmm. um, but educating um, the general public on the need for affordable housing, and I think reports like this rental housing report, and attention, quite frankly, to rental housing, uh, that we need to educate at every level. Congress, you know, I think the tax credit program is a perfect example that people like Buzz that have been involved for years and years and years, the education campaign that is, has been in ongoing for the last two years, that's proof that education can work. I think it's proof. We'll know shortly when tax reform debate comes to a conclusion. But I think it's critically important to educate folks on, on why affordable housing is so important. I think we need to look uh, within the agency. Actually, we have a mandate from President Trump to look at the regulations to see what's getting in the way of what our mission is, and that is to provide a safe, affordable housing for Americans in particular our most vulnerable populations. So HUD does have a number of tools. I think w one of them that has been very successful and this certainly um, we can't take credit for this. We can credit Secretary Sean Donovan for the RAD program and for the folks that you know worked day in, day out to develop that program. But we at HUD, you know, I think have to look at preserving and we have the tools now to be able to do that and to um, unlock the dirt, if you will. That's the best way that RAD has been described to me so that we preserve the affordable housing for future generations. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess along those lines, anything else that given the fact that those report documents, as you well know, our rents, even though they're starting to slow, are still going up faster than inflation, putting a lot of pressure on low-income Americans. What else can HUD do to ensure that there is affordable housing available for them? The RAD is one. Are there other, other levers you're looking at, ever other tools? Well, we're looking at rent reform, and that is uh, there's several people that are working on that around the clock at, at the department. They're, they're working with stakeholders. I think that's critically Say important. Say a bit more about what you mean by rent reform. Rent reform, yeah. looking at our, our public housing stock, looking at our Section 8 housing voucher programs. I, I can tell you the, some of the principles of rent reform, and I have met with several advocates in the last, uh, just in just the last few days where I think there is an alignment of interest, but number one, simplification. You know, the programs at HUD are just way too complicated, crazy complicated, and I, I don't think that helps anybody. Mm -hmm. So simplify in terms of regulations. I think the, um, the other key here is fiscal sustainability. When we're talking about rent reform, mm -hmm. we need more tools in the toolbox to be able to not only produce, but preserve affordable housing. And then I think that the programs have not encouraged uh, self-sufficiency, and we need to look at that with rent reform. That's just a few of the things, and working with the industry and, and the advocates, I think we will be well on our way to be reforming, reforming these programs, which has been a long uh, time coming. I know some reforms have actually uh, been implemented in the last couple of years, but we need a lot to do a lot more. Great. Um, 
I know we don't have you for a lot of time here, and I know that we started out by talking about uh, the disasters that you dealt with, uh, I guess, Katrina uh, during your last go-around. Um, I know this has taken a lot of your time in the, in the 90 days you've been there. Uh, what can you tell us about HUD's response to the disasters in Texas and Florida and, and Puerto Rico, and I guess now uh, California? Uh, Certainly. So if I could just talk about them individually, because sure. you can't put them all in, in one bucket. So prior to my arrival, uh, we had Harvey hit at the end of October, you know, tremendous flooding in, in uh, Texas. But then when I traveled to Corpus Christi last week with the, with the First Lady of the United States, which was fabulous to be on the road with her and to be witnessing the devastation, and that certainly helps bring attention to this. And what are we going to do about it? How are we going to help these families? So we saw different, um, we didn't see the damage so much from flooding, but from the tornadoes that were spawned by the hurricanes. So Houston, huge flooding. Other parts of the state also were flooded, but wind damage was not the major issue in, in Houston. And what has HUD done so far? We um, have provided five, well, we, the American taxpayers collectively, have provided $5 billion in community development block grant disaster funding for the state of Texas to deal with the unmet housing needs. Florida, very different damage, wind damage. A lot of that was covered by insurance, and thankfully that was, the, you know, the governor I think took, you know, the right action by evacuating people and taking all the precautions, but we were very fortunate that that damage was a lot less than anticipated, so we have provided $600 million. And these are not prorated numbers, this is based on unmet housing needs, so homes that are not insured, um, and small business needs. Puerto Rico, incredibly complicated. Puerto Rico was in tough shape, not only financially before uh, Mer Irma and Maria hit the island, um, but the infrastructure was really a sad state prior to the hurricane. Nobody's complaining in Puerto Rico. It was absolutely amazing. Three days on the ground and we never heard anybody complain. They're just remarkable uh, folks. That damage, thankfully, a lot of the uh, buildings in Puerto Rico are concrete block, but the majority of roofs in Puerto Rico have been damaged. And I don't know if this is a well-known fact, but Puerto Rico has the second largest concentration of public housing, only second to New York. 54,000 units of public housing, 30,000 housing vouchers, and another 23,000 project-based rental assistance. So Secretary Carson is the biggest landlord in Puerto Rico, and he takes that very, very seriously. We have more than half of the mortgages that are insured in Puerto Rico, and that's about half of the homeowners in Puerto Rico have mortgages. Half of those are insured with FHA insurance, so the exposure is tremendous. So we have an enormous uh, task ahead of us. It's not what I expected to see. I expected to see a lot of multifamily, high rise, and th that's not the case. There's a lot of single family. So it's gonna be a very complicated rebuilding effort. But you need jobs, and you need the infrastructure, and housing is obviously critically important, but you can't do the infrastructure and not build the housing. You can't do the housing without the infrastructure being addressed. So we don't have enough data to, to um, decide exactly what the, you know, the funding that's going to be needed for that. We're working really hard with FEMA, and most of you know Todd Richardson, the numbers guy at HUD, and he works on this literally around the clock. He's a good man to have on the job. And I can assure you that rental housing will not be ignored in the rebuilding efforts. I think Jonathan touched on why it's so difficult, and the rental housing follows later. It's, there's permitting, there's all kinds of things, but our staff is working very closely with OMB and with the Hill to make sure that this third supplemental that they're working on, that we will have the tools within that supplemental, the direction to be able to address this incredibly complicated recovery effort that is going to be take a very long time. And HUD's role is long-term recovery. FEMA's role is short-term recovery. Well, I'm glad that, that some of the lessons of the past are being applied going forward. Certainly uh, a lot of opportunities to uh, build on those lessons. We so. know what not to do. Good. Um, one last thing I want to ask you about is, so as, as John talked about the report and other, other reports have talked about, is the issue about uh, aging. And I don't want to uh, uh, ignore the fact that certainly families with kids are an important part of the, the population we need to worry about getting stably and affordably housed. Uh, 
but we are going to see a huge uh, bulge of older households renting going forward. And while many of those households will be homeowners, many will still, a large number will be renters. Um, it's going to put a lot of pressure on HUD's programs, I think. So what can you tell us about, uh, from the HUD's perspective, of what are the implications for your operations of a rapidly aging population among renters? Well, I think for new development, HUD just certainly could be in a, in a role, maybe not mandating or is not the way to go, but to, um, again, educate developers, architects, the need for you know this universal design. The new units that come online, it's harder to retrofit units, certainly the older housing stock. So I think we need, and in, in the last 10 years, we've certainly seen um, coordination of public policies. That needs to continue. It needs to be strengthened. Years and years ago when I was at HUD, I had never walked into transportation. I didn't know anybody that worked at HHS. We never talked about education. We talked about housing. That's not the case anymore. And dealing with our, our generation of aging baby <laughs> boomers, we need to be looking at the housing stock based on the need. And certainly healthcare is going to be a component to that because if we can provide services, and we do right now, we have several programs that, that help seniors age in place, but that's gonna be critically important. Um, in, in this fiscal climate, resources are scarce. We're gonna absolutely need to use all the tools that we have, and, and I don't think we have all the tools that we need. So public policymakers, I think, need to work together, and, and we're very fortunate, Secretary Carson, is a doctor, he knows healthcare really well, and let me assure you, he knows housing really well now, and he's a passionate advocate. Well, that's uh, certainly somebody we need uh, to understand these issues, um, because it's going to be a huge, a huge one for the country going forward. Um, you know, we talked about, when we, you and I talked last week, we, we were talking about tax reform. There's a little bit more clarity now uh, than there was. I don't know if you have, uh, the word on the street seems to be that the uh, private activity bonds have been protected, uh, the 4% the tax credit mortgage revenue bonds. Uh, do, do any observations from, from where you sit about implications of tax reform for housing? So the administration doesn't have an official um, position on the private activity bonds, but what I do know, the private activity bonds are part of the administration's infrastructure bill, so there's certainly um, uh, an understanding of what they are and the capability. So I think you know more than I do because you had an opportunity to talk to all these folks from Washington, yeah. D.C., but I have not been privy to the conferees' conversation, so I'm, I'm anxious to see what the outcome of tax reform is. But I do think the advocates, not just working in the last few weeks, but over the last several years, educating lawmakers about the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, you know, our largest production tool, I, I think our most successful public-private partnership, that is making the difference, I'm sure. Great. Um, any last observations, Pam, um, on the report or on your, your job going forward? I'm not surprised by this, but I'm very thankful that the, the folks that have come in, I have seen this, uh, some collaborations, not, not the ordinary people coming together for, for meetings, and I'm just thrilled to see that. I, I feel like the housing community is really developed an esprit de corps, if you will, and I'd like to see that continue. Um, I'm just delighted to see Laura here as the moderator of the next panel. You've really done a great service by reporting accurately on, on the housing landscape. And I think, you know, housing doesn't always make the front page, and she's been successful at getting it on the front page. So thank you for what you do. And I think we need to talk about housing in a, the big picture and keep in mind the demographics the, our housing stock needs to meet the needs, not just of today, but future generations. So thank you to the Joint Center. Continue doing great work, and we will um, be sure to have you back to HUD. Chris came to um, present the State of the Nation's Housing Report uh, a couple months ago, and he has promised to come back and do the rental report. So thank you for this opportunity to participate today. My pleasure. It's really great to have you. Thank you for being with Thank us. I know you've got a few things on your plate. so I do. I would love to stay for the rest of the program, but they booked a meeting for me that I, I have to show up for. So I'm sorry to – I can watch this later, though. It will be. It will be online. It will be archived. Uh, absolutely. All, All right. right. Thank great. you very Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So I invite uh, uh, Laura and the rest of the panel to join me up here now on stage. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Brian, how are you? Good to meet you. Chris Herbert. 
All right. Um, well, thank you so much to everyone for being here. I think Pam uh, certainly just highlighted something that is, a, I think, a challenge for me as a journalist, a challenge for everybody in this room, which is how to get people to pay attention to rental housing, which, um, you know, as the report highlights, is a more and more important part of our housing stock. It's an issue of a lot of change and a lot of tension, and sometimes an issue that gets ignored. So I think we have a lot to dig into uh, today. And, you know, one of the things that the report draws out is, um, we are at a little bit of what might be an inflection point in the rental market. There have been, there's been a lot of construction. Um, is that doing its job? Are we seeing some of these affordability pressures start to start to relieve, relieve themselves? Um, I think that's one of the questions we're going to dig into t to today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about federal politics and a little bit also we've got some great local voices and talk about what Pam touched on, that this isn't just a federal issue as the federal government pulls back. Um, what are cities going to do to step in? Um, so we've got lots to talk about today. Uh, and I thought I would start off um, and ask you, Chris, um, as I said, for years, um, the theme of your report and other reports that I write about uh, has been pretty consistently one of rapidly rising rents and stagnant incomes. Um, what do you think is the most notable finding um, from this year's uh, report? And are we starting to see some, some changes in the market? How is it getting more complicated? Um, you know, I, I think the, and John talked about this in his presentation, the big thing was the, the, the landscape change from the 2015 report where it really was this ever-tightening market to one where we really are seeing the market at a turning point. And the reason why it's a complicated story to tell is because the market's at a turning point, both because uh, the homeownership rate is, is flattening out, which means that phenomenal rate of growth in renter households is slowing, um, also, as a result, the, the supply of housing coming online is starting to slow. We're seeing vacancies tick up. We're seeing, we're seeing rent growth slow. But what we've seen is a lot of supply at the high end. We haven't seen very much supply in the middle of the market. And even though we're seeing the market slow down, it's slowing down in a, in a way that doesn't seem they haven't solved the fundamental affordability problem. And so this, it's tricky to tell because there's a tale of multiple markets there, multiple markets both nationally and also across the country. But I think uh, one telling stat for us was when we looked at the distribution of the rent levels of new uh, apartments coming online, in 2001, we had 41% of those new units were renting, and this is in inflation-adjusted terms, at $850 or less. Um, and then you fast forward to today, it's only 15% of the market. And the flip side was units renting for more than $1,500 were only about 15% of the market, and now they're 40% of the market. So there's been this enormous shift to building high-end housing, partly reflecting the fact we have a lot more high-end income folks renting. But what we haven't seen, and Pam alluded to this, is a filtering process. And so when we look at that, you know, John showed that chart showing what the increase in rent has been at different tiers of the market, there actually has been higher increases among the lowest tier. And so there hasn't been this process of adding high-end units, filtering down. If the supply now is slowing down, we're still going to have growth of moderate and low-income renters, and ha we haven't solved that affordability. So I think you know, the, the, for us, it's this combination of a slowdown in the broader rental market without <coughs> having solved the affordability problem, and how are we going to rectify those problems? So, Shekhar, I'm going to put you on the spot as our embodiment of the private sector for the purpose of this panel. So why, why isn't the private sector building more of that kind of housing? Or why is it building, in fact, even less of the kind of housing that, that Chris is talking about? Um, is it just that they want to make lots of money? But I mean, what are the, what are the different forces that are at play? Um, <laughs> sure. And thank you, Laura. First of all, um, I'm very glad to see the growth in higher income renters. Because suddenly rental isn't one of those things where you automatically assume it's low-income people, it's people of color, they live in certain places. We've humanized this problem and we've made it everyone's problem to an extent. Uh, you know, my son complains about his rent now <laughs> you know, and, and it, because it's $1,800 a month and it's going up. Um, but uh, Laura, no, a, un unfortunately or fortunately I can say categorically it's not the private sector's problem or fault. Um, and it's really simple economics. Um, today, to construct a multifamily complex, uh, it will cost approximately 4 to $5 per square foot. And that's pretty much across the board in any major metro area in the top 50. Rents, on average, uh, that people can afford, if you use the typical 30% of AMI standard, need to be at a dollar a foot or less. That's a gigantic imbalance. 
So you, if you can't buy land, land cost for entitled land for multifamily has gone up 62% in the last five years. Construction costs have gone up, labor costs have gone up. So you can't build for this market that we're talking about. And then on top of that, this was a very predictable problem. You need to build about three to 400,000 new units per year relatively to stay even, i.e. demolition, loss of stock, new household formation, et cetera. For about three and a half years, we didn't build very much of anything from after the Great Recession. So at some point, there was going to be elasticity says, rents are going to go up because there's no supply. Then you had supply, but it could only be at the high end of the market. And you haven't seen any of the filtering that Chris and Pam were talking about. But in my view, there's just one sort of another worse problem. We have a donut hole in our system between those who make more than 60% of median income. So at 60% and below, we can offer some kind of housing options with some subsidy, whether they are low-income housing tax credits or Section 8 or otherwise. Above 60%, there really is nothing until you become a homeowner and you are entitled to get the mortgage in interest deduction. So between 60 and 120, which is where a very large number of Americans live, there's a donut hole in any kind of federal support or generally even state support for housing. So you can't build for this market because of cost. No one's making it easier to build today, and we'll talk a little bit more about those barriers. And you don't have any system of support or subsidy to support that. So I don't see how the market forces on their own can possibly address this. So I think it's a good, good opportunity to turn, turn over to Deputy Mayor Kenner. Shekhar has just said this is, this is not just the private sector's fault. It's also a pu public sector issue. So I guess in particular, why don't you maybe talk a little bit about that, that sort of donut hole that he's talked about. Um, what is the role of cities, municipalities in, in trying to fill that hole? Yeah, I mean, I, I, A, it's, it is, um, and I think correctly stated, I mean, it's, it's a problem in every major metro market uh, that you can, uh, uh, th that's in the United States. You know, I think there are a few ways, um, and no one has completely cracked the, cro the code, and so nobody has solved the problem, but I think that there are some strategies to potentially address it. One is, uh, it is still important to be able to put resources uh, at that sort of zero to 60% of AMI uh, level. Um, the fact that there's additional housing that's being created at the higher levels uh, is f fantastic. What generally tends to happen is that people buy down, right? And so if 60 to 120% can't find anything, they then, because they have to live someplace, are dipping even lower. And so the ability for jurisdictions to continue to focus on zero to 60 is important because they have to produce or preserve as much of that housing as possible because eventually those people who are at zero to 30% get forced out almost of the system. So continuing to have a focus around zero to 60% is still important for jurisdictions even to consider this 60% to 120% of AMI uh, challenge. You know, in Washington, D.C., the mayor here has committed uh, $100 million a year uh, <laughs> specifically to address affordable housing uh, in Washington, D.C., which I think on a per capita basis probably makes us the largest per capita uh, subsidy amount that is locally funded in the country probably around this issue. Um, I think that the second thing, though, is uh, speaking specifically to the 60 to 120 percent of AMI, and it's strange. I actually just came from a lunch with a whole bunch of developers in Washington, D.C., and <laughs> strangely this kind of question came up uh, because, you know, I think that the development community, the private uh, sector community, is thinking about this issue too. They're thinking about their future renters and homeowners, and they're thinking about family formation. You've got to have a product for people to move into, or else you lose them out of your system. And I know in Washington, some developers are talking about sort of a two over two uh, project. It's, it's a smaller townhouse um, product that is a little bit smaller format, which would be sort of your first move up opportunity after you rent something that's 1,200 square feet or so, two to three bedroom. Uh, you can construct it, kind of wood construction, so the construction costs stay low. And you can sort of do two units, uh, one lower and one upper. And uh, we're starting to see a little bit more of that to try to address this sort of workforce housing um, sort of component in Washington, D.C., so that's one thing. Uh, but the biggest thing, and you know, it's sort of the elephant in the room at a local level, I think, um, 
is density, density, density. Uh, the only way to get my friends here to really build more of it is to incentivize them. And at the local level, we have the ability uh, through bonus density uh, requirements, through inclusionary zoning, depending upon how, how that's structured in your jurisdiction, we have the ability to provide an incentive that is not a check that I have to stroke, uh, but it's giving uh, the private sector the ability to build out more square footage and in exchange for that additional density requiring them to either do a certain percentage of housing at a certain uh, area median income level or in Washington, D.C., what's becoming particularly important is at a bedroom size. We've been building a tremendous amount of ones and twos uh, bedroom rental product in Washington, D.C., when the truth of it is, is that if we want to keep the people who are moving here, we need to be building a lot of twos and threes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, density, which has its own uh, uh, proponents and, and detractors uh, at the local level, I think is really the key uh, that local jurisdictions can be doing to incentivize the private sector to build more. So, Mary, let me ask you, so, someone might ask, what is somebody from Minnesota doing on a panel talking about rental affordability? You don't know anything about those problems. But I thought one of the things that the report did a really good job of highlighting is that, sure, we see this a lot in the, t in the biggest nine cities, but we see it everywhere. We see it in these tiny rural areas, too. So talk to me a little bit about what's going on in, in Minnesota and what are, what are the challenges that you're facing there? Well, it's interesting. We uh, just had Chris Herbert out to... Minnesota early in November uh, to talk to uh, uh, the housing community and uh, what we found in looking at the statistics is that uh, the Twin Cities area is very, very much uh, echoing uh, what the findings of the overall national report are. Uh, Minnesota has a very healthy economy right now. Uh, the jobless rate uh, just in the last set of figures was the lowest in the country of any major metropolitan area. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is an expensive uh, uh, environment in which to build, uh, even though we uh, do still enjoy one of the more uh, affordable housing stock. But uh, I've been uh, heading the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency for seven years now, and over that entire time, we've been losing ground in terms of the rise in the cost of rental housing in particular, although uh, ownership housing is now uh, on that same track, as incomes and purchasing power has fallen. And uh, we've actually been blessed with a lot of support, uh, bipartisan support from our legislature and our mayors in terms of supporting the development of housing across the spectrum. But uh, I sometimes feel like I'm losing ground every day despite the fact that every sector is really pitching in in Minnesota to uh, produce new housing and make it affordable. I thought maybe I'd ask you actually one last question, Sekar. We, um, Deputy Mayor Kenner talked a little bit about incentivizing density. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's your view on our local governments getting better about that? We've had this rental affordability crisis now for you know six, seven years. Are you seeing uh, are you seeing more of an effort in that direction to try to make it easier to build housing? Is it having an impact? Um, yes and no. Uh, but I think if you listen to what Brian and Mary said, they're still losing ground every day. So l let's just talk about it and some ideas that are a little bit out of the box. Um, because I think we're at a space right now where we have a real crisis. And we're not acknowledging it fully, this report, tends to bring it out. Um, but until you sort of recognize your problem isn't going to get solved by natural market forces, you don't want to do anything about it because, gosh, the problem will be solved. Um, we have to address land use that discourages density. Um, this is a national problem. I mean, we, we talk about transit-oriented development. We talked about the nexus between transportation cost, housing cost, accessibility to jobs but we don't do a whole lot, frankly, to encourage it. And how you encourage it um, is you make it easier to build there. You make it easier to build density, and then you tell people that when you do that, you have some obligations, and some of those obligations are serving these income strata. Um, to do that requires this cohesive, logical path where politicians, particularly at the local level, stand up to nimbyism, uh, where they say, <laughs> 
yes, we understand that neighborhoods don't necessarily want high-rise construction or necessarily want, quote, low-income people, but that's what we're going to have is the trade for producing housing that's uh, mixed income and going to last much longer and have more sustainability. So first of all, let me give you an example on the building codes. The building codes are some of the most arcane things, and unfortunately, I've had to dive into it a little bit. And uh, basically, it's about 50,000 people in the United States that work in some connection to either a code or a zoning uh, or a planning agency and actually organize themselves into these groups, multiple codes. This, by the way, is about thousands of pa pages of very arcane stuff. <laughs> it has a huge difference. It actually, if you read it and understand it or take your time, it discourages innovation. It does not promote the notion that housing can actually ever be built cheaper. It assumes that housing will always be more complicated. We will always get fatter and want larger homes. And we'll always want <laughs> more things in those homes that are going to cost more money. Now, this is all great as long as the economy keeps growing and incomes keep growing. Once th those factors don't work exactly evenly, you have a magical problem, which is affordability. So, the traditional tools that are used when we have a crisis like this are rent control. Many jurisdictions just say, you know what, we ought to slap a freeze on it. Um, others uh, use tools like they do in DC, the first right of tenant purchase of a building, so you can't be displaced. Um, in my, and then in more recent years, you have inclusive zoning. So inclusionary zoning basically says, I'll give you density in return for this. But by the way, in Tyson's Corner, you can do a proffer. You can say, well, I'll give some money to somebody over here, and I hope they solve the problem, and it's no longer my problem. So the answer is these are very blunt instruments, and the obvious solution, if, I mean, the response with data and the facts that you put out is it is not solving the problem at all. If anything, these are Band-Aids that are making people feel good, but they're not actually addressing the problem at all. You know, I, I, um, I do want to highlight a kind of question of innovation, and I think one of the things we're trying to point to in, in the report, and we talk, there's kind of two, two different problems. One is among the lowest income households, what are we going to do to try to m close the gap between what housing costs and what they can afford? And that's a question of how do we get subsidies and how do we use those most effectively? And I think what we're trying to call more attention to here is the fact that there's a middle part of the market, the donut hole that Shekhar talked about, that the private market ought to be able to address and it hasn't been able to. And I think what we need is innovation. And unfortunately, I think one of the reasons why we don't have it, what the deputy mayor is talking about is different forms of housing, different designs of housing, have to talk about different ways of producing housing. And a lot of it goes back to zoning in terms of density. But the building codes, I think, are really under uh, appreciated important part of that because they stifle that innovation in terms of how you have to build a house, how, uh, what, the, what the unit size is, how much parking, what the materials are. And when you have this kind of you know, code that dictates how you do it as opposed to achieve this goal as cheaply as you can, we don't have as much innovation. And I think there's a lot of public, the cities are doing as much as they can, and as the deputy mayor talked about, that zero to 60% uh, AMI group is not unimportant and gets a lot of attention. What we tend to do is use inclusionary zoning to kind of tax the higher income mm -hmm. housing to pay for that and exacerbate this donut hole, makes it harder to build, fill that donut hole. So I think we're trying to point to that group and say, how do we uh, unleash what the private sector can do better to meet that need? C can I point out one yeah, more problem with the <laughs> codes? I'm glad you brought out the codes. A little <laughs> science experiment here. How many people here live in Washington, D.C.? How many people live in Virginia? How many people live in Maryland? All of the building codes are different. <laughs> so there's no consistency, even though we're here in Washington, D.C. People live and move all around our region. All of our building codes are different. Not only D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, but uh, Laurel versus Baltimore, uh, Loudoun versus Arlington, they're all different. Uh, we have had these, uh, we've, one of the agencies that reports up to me is our Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs that deals with these code issues. <laughs> uh, we have had these sort of summits where we've gotten some of the chief building engineers or chief permitting and licensing people together from jurisdiction. And we've tried to get a little bit better around consistency amongst uh, these different, and they are very complicated at times, building codes for all kinds of things. And we're able to make some progress. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, one thing on the public side, which is always challenging, is 
you know, when we get it wrong, people get hurt, like mm -hmm. physically hurt and sometimes killed. Nobody wants that. And so the reflexive uh, response is then I've got to make sure that I account for that worst case scenario. If I don't account for the worst case scenario, then something could, bad could happen to me. Um, one of the things in our Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs that they've tried, which I think has actually worked out fairly well, is, is two things. Um, one is they have templates for simple things. If you want to do a, a porch on the back of your house in Washington, D.C., I live in Washington, D.C., so I know that our backyard is not that big, but let's not talk about that part. <laughs> uh, but if you want to do a porch on the back of your house, we now have a simplified set of instructions about what you need to do to build that that will pass our permitting relatively quickly and seamlessly and is simple for you to understand because there is such repetition in that kind of construction. We also have done a little bit more as it relates to uh, people's ability to age in place and some ramps th that happen uh, that have that that can occur in some housing and so we've tried to make that a little bit of a simpler process for people so that it's not so arcane and hopefully less expensive second thing is is that we're sort of piloting this idea uh, of seeing if we can give people permits in a day which you know in our world mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. hard to do right Absolutely. Um, and we charge for it but the simplicity, the, the value proposition that we give to our developers is it's normally going to take you between three and nine months, perhaps, to get your permits. You're going to submit. We're going to review. It's going to take time. We're going to send it back to you. You're going to change. You're going to send it back to us. We say if we can get all of our design professionals into the room, we will real time. You propose. We respond. We give it back to you. You change. Give it back to us. We want to get that out in a day. And we've had three. We've had a... Uh, a retail establishment, we've had a large multifamily project, and we've had the new, actually the new um, Apple store that's going to be located here in Washington, D.C. that's in a very historic building, the Carnegie Library. We're all sort of a part of that pilot process to see if we could do it. And we're seeing good results from it, and we're hearing good things back from the private sector, so we're hopeful that that actually also makes it easier and cheaper to be able to build things in Washington, D.C. So, Chris, let me ask you. I I'm a journalist, so I naturally have a bleak and cynical worldview. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to actually ask an unusual question for a journalist. I mean, when you look at some of the numbers in this report, they do show things moving in the right direction. You do see supply doing its job. You see the share of rent burden households going down, albeit in a way that's rather gradual. Um, is there something? Is is there something to the idea that maybe maybe the market's working the way it's supposed to? Maybe things are going well. Well, you know, I, I, as you, you're right. I mean, I think that there are a, way, a number of measures that are showing improvement. So, you know, in 2011, we had 50% of renters that were cost burden. It's now 47 and a half. Uh, we had, uh, as of 2014, which is the peak, we had 21.3 million households cost burden, 11.4 severely so. Both of those are down 20.8 million, down to 11.0 million for severely burdened. So, yes, we're seeing improvement. Um, and the market is providing a lot of housing, and we're starting to see vacancies rise and rents grow slow. So the market is working as it should, except, as I said earlier, I think it, it really struggles to provide housing below that, that top tier level for all the reasons that we just had that conversation. You know, and I think you know, we tend in this country, in a lot of places, to kind of be, take a short-term view. So how, how do we do compared to last year or the year before? So one of the things we're trying to do is make sure we don't lose sight of where we were just as recently as 2001 where we had only 41% of renters that were cost burdened. And at the current rate we're going, and I guess you know, John pointed to this out, the reason why that share has come down as much as it has is mostly because of the fact we've added 2.9 million renters making more than 100,000 who aren't cost burdened, and that's pulling the share down. So we look at that number. So we've gone from 21.3 to 20.8 million cost burdened renters. We're making progress. And as John said, at this rate, It'll be 24 years till we get back to where we were. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and think about it. Where we are right now, we're at full employment. We're actually starting the last couple of years, we're seeing incomes go up. We're starting to see incomes go up faster than rents. This is as good as it gets if, we do, if this is what we're going to do. So if, if we now see construction slow down, which means that pressure on rents is going to slow, uh, we're not going to uh, you know, be able to solve this problem. So I think we have to be innovative on the private sector side. And we also have to think about what do we do for those folks who can't afford private sector housing to close that gap. But Deputy Mayor Kenner, let me ask you a question. And this is something that has long bothered me as a, as a housing journalist, which is 
how we measure success when it comes to, if you're going to put $100 million into housing, how you measure success, because I think one of my frustrations is a lot of cities measure it in terms of numbers of units right. created. And that doesn't, how do we know? I mean, is that solving the problem? Is that the right strategy? So how are you approaching this in DC? What are what what benchmarks are you setting for yourself that you should be meeting? Yeah, yeah a few things. And you know, obviously, especially when it comes to public money, because it's not my money that I'm spending, it's taxpayer money. Um, you know, at some point, you do have to measure yourself by the numbers. So you've got to have a production. If I were, if I had $100 million and I were to tell you that I was producing two units, most taxpayers would not be happy. Uh, they would think something's, <laughs> something's going on with that. So I do have to, at some level, um, measure myself by units. So th that's just inherent in it. But I think t two other things, at least in Washington, that we've tried to do. You know, one is, which is more subtle, but one is in order to help this innovation, in order to help people think creatively about it, in my opinion, there has to be consistency. If, if the market doesn't know whether or not you're gonna be there or not, it's hard for them to really count on that kind of consistency and be able to think, well, if I got this, then maybe I could do that. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of our funding in Washington, D.C., we have committed to doing it every single year uh, because we know that if the private sector can begin to count on that, they can then plan a little bit about what kinds of unique situations, what kinds of ways can they sort of meet the market demand but also meet our uh, public sector needs perhaps a little bit better. So we've been, we've been trying to be good about uh, being consistent. So that's one. Th you know, the second one is, um, and this is more sort of at the policy level, I think. Um, in Washington, D.C., one of the first things that, that the mayor has done is to really think about how do we uh, eliminate, not reduce, not uh, try to put a dent in, how do we eliminate family homelessness in the District of Columbia? And there has been a tremendous effort that, that she really spearheaded, which you know is hard for people sometimes. She said, we have people that are, especially family homelessness, that is concentrated in a few areas of Washington, D.C. We're not gonna do that. They're living in substandard uh, conditions and it's not helping. It's not, it's not solving the problem. So what we're, what we're proposing in Washington is that we're gonna put effectively a small short-term family housing facility in every single ward in the city. Hmm. And it was not without political peril because it sounds good until <laughs> somebody says, well, wait a second, is that going across the street for me? Like, well, <laughs> it's all good until that happens. But uh, her message was, it's a city problem. It's not a problem that you gotta deal with over here, you gotta deal with, it's a city problem. Moreover, the, con the, the actual um, formulation of the, of the challenge is, is that we don't need large shelters. That's not going to solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem is providing humane, smaller facility, 50-unit, almost apartment complexes, for, for lack of a better t term, that's got some shared facilities for services and, and that kind of stuff. And again, this is talking about families. This is talking about mostly single women and children uh, um, that are going to be living in these kinds of facilities. And it's been a, a clear effort that the city has had now, those people also happen to be in that zero to 30% of AMI mm -hmm. band as well. And so our efforts to try to, I think, put a dent uh, to say that the entire homelessness spectrum is something that we need to consider, but we want to eliminate family uh, homelessness in the District of Columbia, I think at a policy level has been an important step because it shows that we are committed to trying to address that income band in particular. Mm -hmm. So Mary, let me ask you. I I've written a number of stories in the last year that I, I did not ever imagine myself writing, which was about rents going down in places like New York and San Francisco. But I don't actually know um, what's been happening that in, in Minnesota. So tell us a little bit about, are you seeing that same kind of improvement that we're seeing on the national level where you are? So I, it, it's interesting, this last uh, conversation, because I think that there are places in the rental housing market that we didn't used to look for trouble that are really where we're seeing trouble now. Uh, for the Twin Cities metropolitan area, we have not yet seen uh, market rents go down. Uh, development there really started a little later than it did on the coast. And I think the uh, real estate brokers around the country were a little late to discover what a great market the Twin Cities area is. So we're a little bit behind the curve on that. I expect with all the construction that we're seeing, 
uh, particularly in downtown Minneapolis and several other areas in uh, near Mi Minneapolis, that we will begin to see that at least leveling off. What really surprised us and uh, really took us aback as a community is the flood of money into our market to buy the B and C class buildings and really reposition them in the market and move the rents in many cases to where uh, the rent levels are now above voucher levels or where building owners are literally saying we will not accept housing choice vouchers and uh, we really had a wake-up call in a Her Springs suburb of Minneapolis uh, with a uh, building that's uh, now called the Concierge Apartments, 700 units of uh, garden-style apartments right across the street from what is now the headquarters of Best Buy. You've heard about Best Buy. Lots of young technology folks and what a great place to have an apartment building to bring up scale. But the carnage that was brought with that was 150 families who had lived in that apartment, often for years, uh, using either housing choice vouchers or vouchers for people with mental illness. Uh, and they suddenly, in a two-month period of time, had to find another place to live. And so uh, we now are really looking very hard at the issue of market affordable housing, uh, and ways that we can address uh, bringing what I think of as sort of compliance light to uh, properties so that they can remain within an affordable range and most especially that they will uh, continue to accept housing choice vouchers as we make the improvements and uh, move them within the market. So what are your ideas so far? Because that's, uh, that's a tough issue for almost every city that I cover. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, actually, following the loss of that property, uh, there was another property literally about a mile uh, across uh, uh, the 494 freeway uh, that was threatened for loss, uh, 400 units. And uh, we have a uh, nonprofit developer that was willing to buy the property, but the seller was uh, saying, no, I'm going to sell to this other uh, for-profit buyer that was uh, planning to reposition the property. Uh, literally, our lieutenant governor uh, contacted the seller and really asked them to reconsider uh, selling to the nonprofit owner. And uh, in this case, it was uh, the Community Development Trust, uh, a longtime uh, community development uh, REIT uh, out of New York that brought the capital to the table. Uh, to be able to allow that owner to, uh, to buy the property. It was not without some uh, significant intervention by the mayor and the city council mm -hmm. uh, in that community who said, mm -hmm. it is important to us, it's important to our families and our school district, interestingly, because they stood to lose a lot of kids if this uh, property went upscale and uh, families were no longer living there. Uh, that really stepped up with some local money uh, to make the entire transaction possible. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I was going to add another example also from Minnesota, where another nonprofit just bought 768 units in 10 apartment buildings around uh, St. Paul and Bloomington. Uh, these are buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s, no amenities to speak of, but well constructed, um, family held, put to the market, selling at incredible prices because the assumption was that you could move in, you could do substantial rehab, and you would move the rents up rather dramatically. Nonprofit buys it with a lot of capital, and in this case, I think it was enterprise that was, but they also had set up a naturally occurring affordable fund in the city, which the city provided, sub not subsidy, but below market financing to enable this to happen, and they've agreed to keep the rents increases below the CPI, um, so they remain affordable long term, and they're going to do modest rehab. But they're also looking for the city to step in and give them some relief from, you know, I call it compliance light, not no compliance, but compliance light. You know, don't expect that this is going to be completely rehab, the roof's going to be redone on day one, but if it's done properly and it meets health and safety standards, let's keep the rents down, let's maintain affordability, and let's make, and by the way, it's 99% occupied. So there is something to be said for the fact that you can maintain 
pri this is private again. It happens to have a mission developer. Uh, but this is what needs to happen around the country and the cities. This is a very local issue. And what I wouldn't have heard of this unless you did something. Well, wh what I'd like to add to that is that as a housing finance agency, we made our first ever investment into an aggregate fund for investing in exactly mm -hmm. this type of housing development. I now know of four different funds from around the country, Enterprise, Community Development Trust, uh, as well as the National Housing Trust, that have invested in properties in slightly different ways with slightly different techniques, which is great as far as I'm concerned because different properties are going to react to different kinds of capital uh, depending on what the goals are. Uh, the goal of the um, uh, one that I mentioned with the National Housing Trust, which also is a, a partnership with uh, the Kresge Foundation, is really focused on uh, acquiring properties in great school districts mm -hmm. uh, and really making those properties available at rents where housing choice vouchers can be used. And often these buildings have no tenants who are currently using housing choice vouchers. So I think what we're doing is uh, we're finding tools that we may have had in the toolbox for a while and starting to assemble those tools in somewhat different ways as this kind of middle section of those buildings uh, built before uh, the 86 uh, Tax Reform Act mm -hmm. that uh, really changed the way that rental housing got uh, financed. Uh, and those buildings are now coming back on the market, needing some modest repair, and trying to keep them within the affordable range. Except there's about five million units like this in the country. And we probably, in com combination of everything everyone's done, have preserved about 100,000 of them. Yeah, so we're still, yeah. we're still peeing in a very large ocean. I, I <laughs> 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 well, uh, no, I was fascinated to see. I think we've talked a lot. Uh, you guys, w John was right. We've talked a lot about the sort of institutional ownership in single family rentals. We have not talked a lot about institutional ownership in the, this kind of, these kind of s smaller multifamily mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a challenge, right? Because it's oftentimes going from one private owner to another private owner, and we live in a free market society. And I don't know, Debbie and Ken, are, have you addressed this much in DC? Uh, sort of the challenge around institutional capital in <coughs> Yeah, and properties. around these kind of, these no naturally occurring affordable housing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the great thing about, I think about most cities is that there is, there are neighborhoods that are naturally affordable. That happens in Washington, DC today. Um, sometimes I have people who say to me, well, because we just opened up our new sort of waterfront wharf area, uh, and people are saying it's unaffordable, and I say to them, it's unaffordable to me too. So like, I mean, <laughs> to be clear like that, uh, there are going to be neighborhoods in every city that are gonna be unaffordable. Um, there are also, however, neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., and I believe that the median home price in Washington right now is 540, 550. That's a significant number, but there are still places in Washington, D.C. where you can buy a single-family house for $300,000 or $350,000, or you can buy a two-bedroom condo for $350,000. And so making sure that we pay particular attention to those naturally affordable uh, communities, which still exist in most metro areas, is something that we think mm -hmm. a lot about, uh, especially as we, um, and as, as jurisdictions and cities, we tend to try to put our largesse into those sort of underserved areas, which causes change, which causes property values to increase. And so uh, in Washington, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is home buyers clubs. Uh, so for two of our projects, um, which are in historically underinvested corridors, naturally affordable communities, um, we've already started this process, even as we're beginning to think about the city making investments in those communities, um, bringing together local people and saying, so if you want to be able to purchase the house that's gonna come here in five years, let's start today. Credit, number one, you gotta get that together. Two, down payment. How can we help you with down payment assistance? Let's talk about that. But preparing people uh, such that when those opportunities do show up, uh, that you're able to, to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think, um, I mean, you mentioned institutional investment and many jobs ago, I used to sort of be on that side. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting um, is how jurisdictions, cities, states can participate almost 
like institutional capital in some ways. Um, in Washington, we've, we've set aside a very small pot of money, $10 million, uh, for something we call a preservation fund. It's just local money, doesn't have any strings in terms of covenant, affordability, and so forth. But what we've done is we've put that as a solicitation out on the street, and we've said, we want to find a fund advisor who's going to be able to bring other capital. So let's say you match that. So it'll be an additional $10 million. $20 million fund. We want that fund advisor to manage it. So I don't want to be involved with picking it. But I got a box. And my box, it's got to be located in Washington, DC. I'm generally looking to make sure that I subsidize units that are between 60% and 80%, 30% and, and 120%, whatever that sort of income band it is. But what I'm really doing is I'm trying to leverage other people's capital, which is mm -hmm. the same thing that institutional investors do, I'm trying to leverage other people's capital to meet my demands. I shouldn't be the only person who's out there trying to select and figure out and, and solve. I need other people's money and help to be able to do that. And so I'm very interested in this idea about how we on the, on the government side can start to think a little bit more uh, expansively about how we address these problems. You know, I would say uh, a couple of things uh, building off that. W one is this question about where you target. You know, and Mary, you mentioned the idea of uh, places where there are good schools, and it's 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 having this vision ahead of time about where are where is this where is it where is it going to be no longer naturally occurring, right? Because if it's naturally occurring, then we don't have to worry about it. But it's right. the fact that it's 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 naturally becoming unaffordable is that we're trying to react to. And the other thing is this notion that really having to have a long vision, mm -hmm. and so it's a hundred thousand units out of five million. But if you know, it's like the low-income housing tax credit. You know, w each year it doesn't produce that many, but now we have 2.4 million because we add to that stock. And as long as we don't lose that stock, so I think it's having this vision now that we understand that this, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to acquire a unit for much less than you can build a new unit and keep it affordable, and it's it's a lighter touch. There's a great report. I give a shout out to rep uh, the Space Between, a report out of Mary's colleagues in Minnesota talking about this issue. And there's a question for the public sector is to say, where do you need to intervene? But I also would say we should have a long-term vision and saying, let's do it now, let's keep at it. When the next downturn comes, there'll be more of an opportunity to acquire these, and let's keep at it through that downturn as well. So I'm sure Senator Kent will, will talk a bit about this, but I think I would be remiss if I did not touch on federal policy. It could well be that while we're all sitting here paying attention, not looking at our phones, they've, they've potentially released a, 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 ta a tax overhaul that could completely change uh, this landscape that we're talking about, um, or it could not. Um, but I don't know, maybe Shekhar, if you want to start off, and uh, do you want to maybe kind of lay the, lay the stage for that a little bit, talk to us about what policymakers could do to re reshape some of these rental affordable housing trends mm -hmm. that we're talking about? Um, so right now, um, if you're very low income, the, I, not only can we not build housing for you, but we can't even preserve housing that you can afford to pay for. So we need subsidy. This is just sort of obvious uh, to those of us in the business. Um, how do you provide that subsidy has always been some question or debate. Um, we have income subsidy programs like Section 8, which pay the differential in rent. And we have programs that subsidize construction that have rent restrictions like the low income housing tax credit. Um, now the low income housing tax credit, which is going to get renamed the affordable uh, tax, uh, tax credit um, housing credit is going to, has done a ridiculously good job by any private sector measure you want to say. I mean, $100 billion has been sold in credits to the private sector. It's created, you know, thousands and thousands of new jobs. It's created almost 3 million units of housing. And it's doing it with leverage. It's leveraging 2 to 1, 3 to 1 new dollars. Um, and our estimates are it's about 35,000 a unit in subsidy. Now, in many jurisdictions, it's insufficient in of itself. So it requires more layers of subsidy, whether it's the income subsidy program or you know, some of the soft money the cities provide and so on. But still, it's a pillar and an anchor. So you know, as the senator knows very well, and she's in with Senator Hatch, introduced a bill that says, look, if something is really working well and can, is, has the engagement of the private sector and the private capital markets, and is efficient, 35,000 a unit to me, as a subsidy to generate you know, roughly 60 to 70,000 new units a year is dramatic. And by the way, these units are kept affordable for 30 years, even though the compliance period is only 15, 10 plus five, because most of the state housing finance agencies like yours require an additional uh, use period commitment. So 
it, you look at the ROI if you're in the Congress, look at where it's really making a difference, and even if you can, tweak it, but grow things that work, and if you can, avoid hurting those that are the most vulnerable at the same time. That's my speech for the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, well, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about what the report tells us about how well that's working or not working? <laughs> sure, you know, we talked a little bit about the degree of uh, trends in the share of households or cost burdens. Um, you know, one important number, it, federal policy for the most part targets people who are very low income, making less than half of the area median income. If you look at that group between 2001 and 2015, it went up by about 4.3 million. So we, you know, as an outfall of the Great Recession and the damage it did to people's uh, opportunity to make a living, that number grew by 4.3 million. At the same time, we have had an increase in the number of households receiving assistance, but it's only been 600,000. So we've gone from a situation where 28% of people who are uh, arguably eligible for assistance for housing supports got it to one where 25% are getting it. So th as the problem has gotten bigger, we haven't really done, any, uh, done enough to ramp up the degree of support to keep up with that problem. And I, I think it's important to bear in mind, too, that who are the people who are mostly getting assistance? And roughly a third are elderly, roughly a third are disabled, and of the other third, half of those are families with children. So for the most part, these are among our most vulnerable uh, folks in, in our society. And so to the extent that those are the people that we're trying to help, and I think in particular, you know, the families with children, trying to give people a chance to have affordable, stable housing to get themselves in a position to advance and do better. Pam mentioned the idea that housing assistance ought to support people uh, in economic mobility. I think everyone would agree with that. And I think one thing we could also agree on is it does take money. It takes, first of all, having that stable house to, to have a base, but then the other assistance, the child care, the workforce training, the like to go with it. So uh, this is an investment that will cost money, but it's an investment that I think consistently in studies shows that there is a payback for that investment. Well, so Deputy Mayor Kenner, let me ask you, because um, when Chris asked Pam a little bit about what we can do about rental housing, she sort of turned it around and said, well, what can, what can cities and states do? They should do their part. So I'll let you kind of turn the tables a bit. I mean, what, what do you need the federal government to do that you can't do yourselves? <laughs> uh, <laughs> one is keep private activity bonds. Let's just start with that. They gotta, don't, <laughs> don't play around with that. that that'd be one thing. First um, do no harm. Exactly, <laughs> that'd be one. Um, you know, and I think I see our former uh, executive director of the D.C. Housing Authority, who's now head of National Housing Authority, um, uh, and I think that the amount of funding that public housing has been not getting over the last 10 years or so, uh, you know, th that is in many ways our most vulnerable population. That is that clear sort of zero to 30 percent of AMI category. Um, additional federal assistance or uh, and whether that's in the form of additional vouchers or whether that's in the form of additional funding to support maintenance which I know is you know the thing that I because I also sit on the DC's housing authority board you know the, the thing that worries me more than anything is just the maintenance costs that come with uh, that come with public housing and that's not just in DC that's everywhere as a matter of fact somebody once told me with the New York City Public Housing Authority uh, uh, maintenance backlog was for their entire portfolio, and it was like almost the size of our entire budget. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I cannot, <laughs> cannot deal with that. So one would be additional, more assistance on the public housing side from the feds, I think, would be good. And then, you know, I think, two is additional, um, you know, the same way that there have been some landmark federal pieces of legislation that have helped um, uh, spur either low-income housing tax credits or additional uh, subsidization, uh, you know, tax exempt debt. If there are some additional tools that can be given to jurisdictions to be able to utilize, I think that that would be, uh, that would obviously always be uh, helpful because we, we suffer a little bit from uh, just being able to locally fund things. And so if there's some additional ways that the feds can give us another subsidy tool, that would be transformative. Mary, I'll ask you kind of as, uh, answer a similar question. I mean, from a, a state perspective, um, what are you looking at on the federal policy level that could either help or hurt your going forward in the next year or so? 
So we heard Pam talk a bit about uh, some of the successes at HUD, and uh, she talked about RAD, uh, and uh, it certainly has been a powerful tool moving uh, public housing units uh, to leverage in the private sector. At the same time, the challenge we find uh, is that resources that are now being used uh, to convert those properties are no longer available for new construction of new uh, low-income uh, properties. So um, while I, I think that we have a lot of the right tools in the toolbox, uh, the Housing Commission that, uh, that Pam led just a few years ago uh, really recommended a 50% increase in the low-income housing tax credit, also recommended uh, more fully funding rental assistance, but targeting it more effectively. I mean, there's some really good recommendations there, well thought out, uh, that I think we need to go back to and say, wasn't there a good basis for uh, the economic argument for which tools we could really use more effectively if we had a little more flexibility? What did you all think when she talked about rent reform? That was something that was a little new to me. And what do you think the implications of that might be? Anyone? <laughs> Shekhar, do you, do now, you? Nowadays, when people use the word reform to me, it usually means you're cutting something and giving it to somebody else. <laughs> so I'm a little bit skeptical, but I think the theory of self-sufficiency, the notion of economic empowerment, I mean, um, Enterprise Foundation just released a new tool called the Opportunity Index, which talks about how do you measure communities and where do you make investments. Back to all the themes we we're talking about, where families get the support systems that they need well beyond housing, including all the way through employment and self-sufficiency. So I think some of the themes are right, but I, you know, I'm always skeptical of motive. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think. Um, there's certainly a conversation to be had about how to make more efficient use of subsidies. And so what I would hope she means by rent reform is, is how do we do that? And, you know, I think, you know, for example, um, I don't know if she was including in there this notion of small area FMRs. And so the idea is that you could, uh, rather than charge an FMR, a fair market rent for mm -hmm. the entire metropolitan area, think about ways of charging ones that are more sensitive to what's happening in specific neighborhoods. Now, there's not that doesn't happen without costs. I mean, I think there are ways in which if we do that quickly, then people can find their rents going up in a way they can't afford. And so, but I think there's a conversation to be had about how do we make sure that the rents we're paying aren't are are efficient for wh where people are living, and how do we give people the right incentives to move to different areas of opportunity and the like. And so, I'm sure there's lots of ways we can think about how to do it efficiently. I hope, as Shekhar said, it's not just code word for cuts. Um, without thinking about really making, getting more bang for their buck and addressing the kind of fundamental issues that, that are needed by these fa families who are getting this assistance. I'd love to work with Pam on it because, you know, she knows housing, she understands the issues, um, and see where it goes. But I'd be watchful. Mary, I don't know if you have right. any... Um, I, I would echo the... Um, I think all of us would like to see ways in which we can incent economic uh, upward mobility. Uh, and more stability for the families because more income in a family is going to mean they're going to be beta better able to afford housing. And, uh, but I, I do also have the concern that if it just means cuts, uh, that we, we could be doing a lot of damage. So uh, like Shekhar, like Chris, uh, we look forward to uh, working uh, with the current staff at HUD to see if there are some ways we can do things better. Um, well, Chris, what can you tell us about what the outlook is for the rental market going forward? Are, are things going to continue to get better? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I, I, would, I will say I don't necessarily have a crystal ball, right? And so there's uh, one thing I will say is that based on the Joint Center's demographic projections, we are expecting to have strong household growth over the next decade. We're having, we expect to have that strong growth because of the fact that the millennial generation is the largest generation in our country's history. They have been slow to form households. My 24-year-old is still living at home. God bless him. I love him. <laughs> um, but, and, he's, and he's there for a reason. He's there partly because of all the things we've been talking about, how expensive housing is and the like. But I think that ultimately they do move out, and we're seeing that. The oldest millennials are now in their 30s. And so the decade ahead is one that's going to be strong for household formation. Uh, we are coming down off of 
uh, I was going to say a sugar high, but I, when you have the home ownership rate go from 69% to the 63%, that's really spurred this incredible growth in rental households. That is e ending, I would say. And we're going to go get back to a more normal level. That more normal level should be 400 to 500,000 uh, increase in renters a year, which by any historical standard is a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think we're still going to see strong growth for renters. As we say in the report, the profile of who rents has shifted. It's much more common now for people making $100,000 to rent. Why is that? There's a host of reasons having to do with um, the recognizing the appeal of renting, uh, the fact that people are getting married later, having kids later, and the like. So we expect to see that stay the same. But I think the, the challenge that we pointed to really is this question about how do we provide that affordable housing that we need um, in the middle of the market. Um, Mary, I think one of the things I, I haven't asked about as, as much that I, I think is an important question, which is um, housing touches on all of these other issues, education, health, infrastructure. It's not just about housing. And what do you think is sort of the way forward in terms of trying to integrate those a little bit better? I think this is one of the most important uh, things about the next few years. And uh, Pam mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the silos are broken a little bit more uh, within the Washington bureaus. I will tell you that they've uh, opened up a lot more at the state level because um, we've had to. And uh, one of the things that we really know now is that um, stable housing is really a key to success in many areas that we struggle with as a society. It's better for kids to succeed in school. And if kids succeed in school, they'll be better employees, they'll be uh, healthier, happier, and more financially stable adults. They also help people who are struggling with chronic health conditions, whether that's a disability or whether it's something like uh, chronic diabetes. If you don't have a stable house, you really have a hard time managing medications or regimens that will help you uh, to cope with that chronic health condition. And it's that intersection where I really think there's some promising work. We met just last week in Minnesota. We're a pilot state for uh, some work that's being done uh, with the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, for being able to do a better link of healthcare dollars with uh, the ability to stably house people. And this is something that I think is really promising at the lowest end of the spectrum where we're spending, in many cases, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars for people to make return visits to emergency rooms when if they had a stable place to live, they could really manage their chronic conditions and be able mm -hmm. to uh, uh, live much more affordably for society as a whole. I got it. Senator Cantwell here. And uh, I think everyone will be very curious to hear what she has to say, so I won't, I won't hold up too much, but I, I, anything else, I mean, I, I want to give you guys a last word if there's anything else you want to mention. Yeah, go for uh, it. Yeah, and if there's an industry that needs to be transformed, it's the housing industry in general, but the affordable housing industry in particular. So we need a lot more innovation in building code, in building construction, in the types of housing we're producing, and how to reuse existing housing spaces. And if we really spent a lot of time and attention there, instead of just thinking about capital structure and subsidy systems, I think we would do ourselves a great service in the next few years. I'd like to add that um, I, I think the call for uh, local action is an important one. Uh, in Minnesota, we have something known as the Regional Council of Mayors, which is uh, actually sponsored by our, uh, uh, our ULI chapter in Minnesota. And that's been a forum for mayors to learn more about the importance of having a full range of housing choices in their communities, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it helps their economic competitiveness. We increasingly have employers who say, uh, you know, we're located here in the suburbs. We don't have any place for people to live. And so we're seeing an increasing uh, debate at the local level about understanding that you need a full range of housing choices. And I think that uh, is a very promising direction for us. Being, um, being a YIMBY, a yes in my backyard, <laughs> is good for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. It's good for 
uh, increasing density, it's good for the growth of cities, um, number one. Number two, Congress, stay the hell away from private activity bonds. <laughs> 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 Eliminate private activity bonds. Affordable housing gets way more difficult. So please stop messing around with private activity bonds. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We covered the whole gamut of topics today, and you came along for the ride. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Over the last 10 years, we've seen the largest gain in the number of renters in any 10-year period on record. And as the Joint Policy Center projects, the number of renters will increase by nearly 500,000 from 2015 through 2025, which is just a way of saying this problem is not going away. And yet, supply has really failed to keep up with the increased demand. Between 2001 and 2013, the United States lost nearly 13 percent of its existing rental stock, including many that were converted into market uh, rate units. And your report, which also uh, makes this issue very clear, 1.1 million units are also at risk of being lost in the near future. New construction has not filled the gap. And the rising cost of land and materials and constructions, as your report shows, has made affordable housing development even more expensive. We have seen from 2000 to 2014 the lowest 10-year production rate since 1974. So yes, decreased supply, increased demand <coughs> equals the crisis that we see today. So the results of these dynamics are having unbelievable impacts on American families. We face the national shortage of 7.4 million affordable rental units, and we've seen a 60% increase in the number of Americans who are now calling themselves unaffordable in the category of spending more than 50% of their income on rent. And this isn't just isolated to lower income families. It's a pretty broad impact among a lot of different aspects of our economy. That is why the legislation we've proposed tries to deal with that by broadening the spectrum. But we have to see that uh, between this last year, roughly last year, 10-year period, a total number of Americans facing extreme housing unaffordability has exploded from 7 million people to 11.2 million. As I said, that 60% increase. Our own State Department of Commerce told us that if we do nothing, that it will take 30 years for us to ever come close to filling this gap. So that means that the crisis is going to continue to accelerate and that we actually need to do something. And I heard in this last discussion a little bit about the millennial generation the number of them that are never going to be homeowners or be higher renters, the fact that these demographics, as I mentioned, of baby boomers reaching retirement and not having enough savings is also going to be a demographic trend. So what do we do about it? Well, this is why Senator Hatch and I are fighting with legislation to improve the affordable housing tax credit and the amount of capital being put towards that. I asked Senator Hatch to work with me on this because the state of Utah has done incredible work in just putting every veteran into a home, no matter what the reason or consequences, to make sure that a roof over the head was the best way to get people to be more productive and to have more opportunity. Our legislation now has 22 co-sponsors and is pretty evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. We've really tried to focus on making it bipartisan. And yesterday, we spoke at the Bipartisan Policy Center about this legislation. They, too, released a report on some pretty interesting demographics, and I'll get to those in a second. But this legislation was actually part of the 1986 Act. So if you think about it, uh, since 1986, we've been able to preserve and provide 7 million low-income families affordable housing. We now should be doing and using this opportunity to actually improve those opportunities for more Americans. The low-income housing tax credit over a 10-year period of time has, and what we want to do with this legislation, is increase 400,000 more units. A huge percentage of the affordable housing units that are developed are developed with a tax credit. That is to say that if we don't increase the tax credit, we are not going to get out of this problem that we face today. So the fact that it has been a great bipartisan success, that it has worked, and that has created very positive results for many families, we think is a very positive aspect of the story. But we also think that people are losing sight about how stimulative housing is in general and how many jobs were created during that period of time, 400 and 
52,000 jobs we think would be new jobs in addition to the impact that we've already seen if we would be able to pass this legislation. It has struck me in looking at this that it used to be when we were talking about how to stimulate the economy in the 60s or 70s or 80s, you would hear this big cheer for housing. It was always such a big aspect of our economy. You really haven't heard that cheer since the economic downturn. It's almost as if people are afraid to say it. And it has fallen from 15% of GDP to 12% of GDP, housing in general. So while we can talk about what that means for the entire market, what we know is that more pressure has been created on the lower end and they have the fewest opportunities to do anything about it. That is why we need to increase the tax credit, as we, have I mentioned, by 50%. The Bipartisan Policy Center put out their report, which also talked about the health outcomes of those individuals, and that too was just mentioned in your panel. They actually uh, have seen a 62% decrease in emergency room costs, a 66% decrease in ambulance costs, a 59% decrease in overall health care costs just by putting those individuals into affordable housing. We mentioned one individual that was from Spokane who the numbers that uh, were provided to us by the provider there had been to the hospital and emergency room as they were homeless 66 times in one year. Since they've been living in affordable housing, they've been twice. And so it shows you that putting a roof over someone's head is the best stability in reducing health care costs. And it's one of the reasons why we've tried to be so vocal, even in the tax conference committee that I serve on, about the very issues that will erode our opportunities. Three aspects of the tax bill before the United States Congress at least in the provisions currently uh, written by the House and Senate, did damage the affordable tax, uh, affordable housing uh, marketplace. One obviously was mentioned here on private activity bonds and changing their tax status, and I believe that right now negotiations are still back and forth on this, uh, even trying to say, well, if we put it back in, we're going to change the carry forward and limit it, which would also limit about a third of the development, which we also don't want. Let's just keep current law. That's a really good idea. Secondly, the Senate provisions, both on a lower corporate rate, which will do nothing to stimulate more investment in housing, actually reduces the percentage of investment, you know, from 30 uh, down to 20 percent will reduce, uh, 35 to 20 percent will reduce the amount of investment per dollar credit, which is also problematic. And the B, the base erosion language will also disincentivize foreign investment. We think those three things taken together could potentially reduce the amount of investment in affordable housing by 50 percent. We're trying to say, let's go the other way. Let's take the standard we're at today and increase by 50 percent to meet this crisis. So I will admit it's very busy days right now playing both offense and defense defense in trying to keep the current program and not undermine it with the current tax bill and also play offense by actually getting our colleagues to increase the amount of available credit. This is so important for us and for our economies all across the United States of America. Everyone deserves to live in an affordable place with dignity, to be able to raise their children, to be able to access the American dream. The good news for all of us who care about this issue so passionately is that it truly is economical. It truly is stimulative and it truly will give us better opportunities for the future. We just need to break through with the number of issues being discussed to get people to realize that the crisis at hand is only going to exacerbate if we do nothing and that a true solution is at hand. So I thank Harvard and the Joint Center for your good work, for bringing light to this important issue, and hopefully helping us push through the last efforts to really build on the affordable housing tax credit and get the crisis addressed today. Thank you all very, very much.
we'll take a, a few questions. If anyone has any questions for the senator, no, nope. or comments. <laughs> I can't believe there's a Let's yes right here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me answer the, the last part first. You have to have a ladder, and we have to have the first rung of the ladder. And Housing First in, um, is a great program, but having a place to start and then continuing through the process is, is very important. I'm very concerned about uh, youth homelessness, particularly, and the Rakes Foundation. I don't know if people are familiar with them, but the Rakes Foundation is doing some incredibly insightful work on this. And the populations in general of homelessness and Native American uh, homeless or housing issues and rural housing issues are all addressed in our bill by trying to increase the amount and attention and focus to those issues. As you all know, because, or many of you do, I would assume you're very involved in these issues, we are swamped with the demand. And so consequently, states try to make these decisions based on how much we are serving those communities, but with so little available given the demand, it, we've had to make ex some very excruciating decisions. What we need to get um, our colleagues, well, we need to get everyone aware of is the fact that these problems exist in rural areas. They do. Uh, they exist everywhere. If you have a lack of resource to meet the crisis, the crisis exists everywhere. It's not is just this issue of, oh, you guys have had unbelievable growth in Seattle. You can go to Walla Walla or you can go to Yakima and you can see the same challenges that they face in trying to provide affordable housing. If there's not enough credit, people aren't going to build. I've seen the statistic, 95% of affordable housing being built with that credit. So if you don't have the credit, no one is going to build the housing at this level. So we are putting a little bit of federal dollars on the table to stimulate a lot of private sector investment. I think that's a good, a good investment. So what we have to do is show that that exists across the board, and it does. And we've seen some very, very positive programs in rural parts of our um, country, and we should just keep uh, talking about that. But the, the legislation does try to focus on, on both rural and Native American populations. And we've seen some very good work on, in uh, Indian country in the state of Washington on uh, affordable housing projects, but you could be doing so much more. You could be doing so much more. And you would assume that many House members and other senators hear this in their own districts. What are we not doing as Housers in terms of educating uh, people on both sides of the aisle about this issue and why are we having to fight so hard just to stand still? They do not know what I just said. They do not. 
and that is not an indictment of them. I will tell you, I have been involved with the tax credit for probably 10 years now, and even I did not know that about 95% of the affordable units were built with the credit. So I had been involved in the downturn when it was hard to figure out, uh, you know, how, how to work with states and how to and some other changes and tweaks to the legislation as we've had it um, renewed. It's permanently there, but we've had to make some fixes to it. But even I did not know that it was the driver. So first of all, people see some of the issues. They don't understand these numbers from a demographic perspective. They don't. And they don't know that this is the solution. Now, I would say Senator Hatch does because he's been working on this and he's, I'd say Senator Wyden does because not only he's the ranking member, but he's also from Portland and he knows what a big issue it is. But I, I would say the majority of our colleagues and even I didn't fully understand that this is the issue. So now we could talk about what else to do with HUD. We could talk about other avenues. But a lot of my colleagues, if you start talking about other investments in housing right now, they wouldn't be on the same page. So what also is missing is not only is this a good solution and had bipartisan support, it's probably the only thing that can get bipartisan support right now. And that's why we have to put our foot on the accelerator and get it done, because otherwise the crisis will just be uh, even more exacerbated. So, But we have to go back, back to basics and get people to understand that. And that's why what everybody's been doing and their reports have been so critical. So thank you all very, very much. As the Senator said, these are busy days. And so we are very grateful to Senator Cantwell for, for taking time to be with us today. We're also very grateful for her leadership on this issue. I think bringing attention to this and, and as she said, making people aware of this is also important. Um, please keep the discussion going on Twitter with the hashtag House, Harvard Housing Report. Please visit our website. Uh, there's a lot of information there. We hope people will use that and bring the message back to wherever you're from. Um, and let me thank you all for being with us here today and all your interest and in, uh, in focus on this issue. So thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great day.